up with me too. I trust that your holiday was a good one, hopefully stress-free and very relaxing. I know it was pretty chill for us, but um, we're happy to be back and get right into it and just be um, just um, expecting of the great things that God's going to do this year. Let's pray some worship together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, again while we're made. Come set
people forget that. I have to do something. In 1965, a theater group called the San Francisco Mind Crew created a new form of protest by staging a series of events that they called guerrilla theater, just like guerrilla warfare. They called this guerrilla theater. These spontaneous staged acts in public places often used to boo or provocative acts to gather a crowd and impress upon the audience their message. They did something unexpected, and as a result, people paid attention and listened to their message. Curiosity made people listen when it was more than just words. People who would never stop to listen to them rant in a bullhorn stayed to watch their show that expressed their same ideas. The most important, most compelling message in the world will be ignored if your presentation is boring. It will be ignored if you can't get past the short attention span of the cell phone generation and wow someone. It'll be ignored if it's merely words and not deeds. If I want to talk about the biggest problem with Christianity in America today, it's that we say a lot of the right things, but when it comes down to it, we're not living in such a way that it compels people to listen to what we have to say. If it's a message that people need to hear, but they don't particularly want to hear, you need to be even more provocative in order to capture their attention and trigger their curiosity. And so enter stage left, John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, it says this. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now John's clothes were made out of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warm you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out, out of these stones, God can raise up new children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. It sounds a lot like uh, the, uh, the book of James here. Verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John had a simple message. His simple message was, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is here. That's a real simple sermon. Like, there wasn't, that's what he said. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is here. Now, to repent means to change directions or change allegiances. John is giving an invitation, and new kingdom's here. You want to be a part of it? But he's also giving a warning. This new kingdom will destroy the old kingdom, so make sure you get out of the old kingdom into the new kingdom. John's message is telling people to change their citizenship from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life. And John sees himself, his mission, his personal role on earth as being the herald of Jesus. In other, world, in other words, as uh, Steve Sable used to tell me, uh, John is Jesus' hype man. That's exactly what he's doing here. He's hyping up Jesus before Jesus comes out of the scene. Now, John quotes from the scroll of Isaiah 43. Uh, to talk about his role here, he says, I go before Jesus to get people ready for his arrival. Heralds were the messengers of the ancient world. They were really similar to modern-day diplomats. They would go from one kingdom into another kingdom to deliver pronouncements of a foreign king. Servants of one kingdom traveling to another to speak on behalf of their king. Uh, and then in verse 4, we have this strange description of John. He lived and preached in the wilderness. Uh, he wore a rough skin of camel's fur. So people, most people wore wool. They didn't wear camel fur. So he just looked like a weird mountain man, you know? As he's got his camel fur on. Um, and then it gives us this other weird detail. He lived off of locusts and honey. Now John here was a provocateur. Um, can you imagine him speaking? He's like, 
Repent. The new kingdom is coming. The old kingdom is burning up. It's over. And then he's like, break for lunch, everybody. And people are bringing out their loaves and their fish. He goes over and he's like, be high. And like, Winnie the Pooh, he's digging his hand around him in the beehive. And he's just pulling out. He's like, delicious. You know? Like, that's what I imagine him doing. And we really don't have any problem with that. Honey's good, right? We still eat honey. But when it comes to eating, like, locusts, that's pretty gross. Did you know Whole Foods sells chocolate covered crickets? Yeah, they do. Um, now, of course, his weren't chocolate covered, but can you imagine him? He's like, repent! Repent, the kingdom's coming. And then he's like, hmm, locust. He grabbed it, and his weren't chocolate covered, but you can really taste the lips. I'm just kidding. This is a book on. But <laughs> Andy just about passed out. But can you imagine just that act right there of pretending to eat a chocolate covered cricket, the reaction from the crowd? That's exactly what John was doing. Okay? He was drawing interest to his message and to what he saw as his mission to prepare the ground for Jesus. John wasn't crazy. He was creating a persona that would prompt curiosity and interest in his message. People would remember his words because of what he did. Just like you're probably going to remember this message and forget a lot of my other ones, because you're like, I thought I ate a cricket. Um, John is drawing, he's not just drawing attention to his message, but he's drawing some analogies to an ancient story by dressing like this and eating like this. He's trying to draw hyperlinks to some Old Testament stories. Wearing an animal skin would immediately make the Jews well versed in the Old Testament. Think of the story of Genesis 3 where God clothed Adam and Eve in the skins of animals. The fact that he didn't sow crops or herd animals, but merely lived off the land, would make them think of the abundance of Eden. John was dressing like he had just come from Eden, because that was the kingdom he was representing. The king of Eden was the king that he was heralding and representing to these people. In verses 5 through 6, we get some insight into where this was happening. John's message was drawing a crowd and people were gathering at the Jordan River. I think I have a picture up here of the Jordan River. Beautiful, right? If you wanted to pick a spot that would convey images of Eden, this was probably the best possible spot in all of rocky, barren Israel. Along the Jordan River, it was vibrant. It was full of wildlife and trees and flowers. The Jordan River, though, it's not like the Scuba River. Well, in some places it is. But it's not like uh, the Delaware River. It's more like a creek than a river. In its widest spot, it's only 100 feet wide. In its deepest spot, it's only 17 feet deep. In most places, it's actually quite narrow and quite shallow. But this narrow little creek comes up in multiple biblical stories. Jacob crossed it before God blessed him in Genesis 32. After the exodus from Israel, Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan on dry ground in Joshua 3. And uh, Naaman, the Syrian captain, was killed of his leprosy at Elijah's command in 2 Kings 5. Which brings us to the peculiar practice of baptism itself. It's kind of a weird thing. Have you ever thought of this? Like, why do Christians dip people in water? That's weird, right? What a strange thing. In verse 6, it tells us that bapti baptism involved a confession of their sins. And in verse 11, it also involved repentance, changing allegiance from one kingdom to a new kingdom. Baptism was a public expression of leaving the old kingdom behind and embracing the new kingdom. Think of baptism like this. Baptism is like a marriage ceremony. The ceremony doesn't make you love each other, but because you love each other, you marry. As G.K. Chesterton said, love cannot help but bind itself with promises. When you love each other, you just make promises to each other. Because that's what love does. Baptism is a public promise that you're going to spend your life learning to live and love like Jesus. It's a public pronouncement, just like marriage. It's a commitment before a crowd that says, I'm going to hold to this love. As in marriage, you swear to love no other. In baptism, you swear to serve no king but Jesus. In the New Testament, as Jews and Gentiles alike acknowledge Jesus as king, the disciples baptize them. Um, our neighbor on our street is a refugee from uh, Guinea, and she's working to become a U.S. citizen. 
And so she's always talking about the paperwork she's filling out and the classes she's doing and all the steps and all the red tapes she's going through. One day soon, she will excitedly pledge allegiance to the flag and become a full-fledged American. She's looking forward to that with great anticipation. Baptism is a way to publicly announce that you're a full-fledged citizen of the kingdom of Jesus. Now, in our modern Western world, the idea of baptism has become muddy and complicated in modern Christian traditions. Up until the 12th century, most Christians were baptized by immersion. Um, they were submerged underneath the water, just like we do here at Horizon, as a result of a confession of faith in Jesus. The word used here in Greek is baptizo. Literally, it means to be immersed or submerged. It's not always used in the idea of water, but it could be used in cooking and cleaning, anytime you're completely submerging something. Many of you, especially if you grew up in a Catholic or Presbyterian church, were baptized as infants. And I understand how those groups come to the position that they do, um, but if you look through the Bible, there's nowhere in Scripture where a baby is baptized. Your family hoped by baptizing you as a baby that it would ensure you sided with Jesus as an adult. I think that's noble and can be honored, and you can celebrate that and say, thanks, Mom and Dad, that you wanted me to grow up to be a follower of Jesus. But baptism, each and every time in the Bible, is a conscious choice of someone to do these two things, to confess their sins and to repent, to change allegiance to an allegiance to Jesus. It's a conscious, choice, a conscious choice of someone to side with Jesus, to renounce the citizenship of their own kingdom, and join Jesus in his kingdom. And if you've never made that choice to be baptized, I encourage you to consider it. Baptism doesn't save you, Jesus does. But not being baptized is a little like telling your long-term boyfriend or girlfriend, I love you, but I don't want to marry you. Uh, I like you, but I want to keep my options open. I realize that being baptized is a big decision, um, it's something you need to think about and pray about and really be certain about before you do it. You don't get married on a whim to a stranger. Get to know Jesus for a while before you're ready to swear allegiance to his kingdom. But if you've been thinking about it, you've been praying about it for a while, it's a great time to do it. John's strange message attracted the attention of the religious leaders. It says Pharisees and Sadducees showed up to kind of check out what he was doing. They were investigating his teachings to see what they thought of them. Now, the Pharisees were obsessed with oral tradition. We see this come up all the time when they talk to Jesus. Jesus will say something from the Old Testament, and they're like, yes, the Old Testament says that. However, we also have 10,000 additional laws that we added to that in our oral tradition. Um, and then the Sadducees rejected oral tradition. They said, we only hold to the law of Moses. That's the only thing. But we think Moses was wrong about resurrection. Once you're dead, you're dead. There's no resurrection. Um, and so they both had their own issues. And normally they fought with each other and hated each other. But they both kind of had their hand in Rome's pocket. And so they had sold their morality for positions of power and influence in the local Roman government. And occasionally they united here to critique John. And later they united to oppose and ultimately kill Jesus. John continues a long tradition of the prophets of the Old Testament, calling out the sinfulness and the selfishness of the religious leaders of Israel. And notice what John calls them. He says, you're a brood of vipers. Now, this isn't um, John getting a little salty as he plays Xbox Live, you know, when he's like, you brood of vipers. You know, this isn't random trash talk. What he's saying is, you're a family of serpents. You come from the serpent bloodline. In Genesis 3.15, and the first promise of the coming king, God tells the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will strike the seed. God predicted that there would be strife between the family of the snake and the descendant of the woman. John is calling the religious leaders of Israel descendants of the serpent in Genesis 3. That's what he's saying when he says, you're a brood of serpents. You come from the snake family. He's saying you're serpent spawn. You're agents of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that the coming king is coming to quench and destroy. John has some guts. Okay? You're just one guy, a wild man, preaching out in the wilderness. And the big wigs, these are the big time, the religious leaders who can make or break you, 
They come out to hear you, and what do you, you know, he's not like, oh, the important people are here, I gotta put on my best show. He's like, your snake family, that serpent in the garden, you're of that same line. Instead of cultivating favor with the powerful, he punches below the belt. How often do I sit at tables that I think Jesus would have flipped? How often do I curry favor with the influential instead of pissing them off just like John would have? <laughs> In verse 9, John suspects what these religious leaders are thinking. He says, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you're Abraham is heirs. So you don't need to repent. You don't need to confess. You're good. They're coming up with reasons why they don't have to repent and be baptized. And we do the same thing. Like we sit and we hear someone open the Bible and talk about stuff and we're like, yeah, that's somebody else's problem. I'm so glad that so and so is here and hearing this because they've done this major problem. This is for them. You know, I so wish my my family member or my friend or my neighbor was here because they really needed to hear this. And we start coming up with reasons why it doesn't apply to us. And their reason about why it doesn't apply to them was they think their bloodline makes them Abraham's heirs, so they're good. And let's look at what Jesus says a few years later to the exact same group of religious leaders opposing him. This is in John 8, verses 39 to 41. Abraham is our father, they answered Jesus. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham didn't do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. Like you, Jesus. The only father we have is God himself. You belong to your father, Jesus said, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and a father of lies. Jesus picks right up where John left off, right? He says the same thing. He says, you are descendants of the serpent, the snake. You are not. You think you act like you're the religious leaders, but actually you're working for the dark side. Now, notice the slam that they say to Jesus there. We're not an illegitimate son like you. We know who our father is. Because we can trace our bloodline to Abraham. Because we're the sons of bearers. They think their relationship with God is secure. Now, the Jews made a proselyte. Someone who wasn't Jewish. who wanted to come and worship the Jewish God, Yahweh. They had to undergo ceremonial washing. Which is literally being baptized. And to be welcomed into the family of Abraham. What they're telling John is Jesus, that they're already in. They're like, we're in. We don't need you, John. We don't need your baptism. We're already in. To Jesus, they're like, we don't need you. We're Abraham's descendants. What do we need with you? They can't see that they are outside the kingdom of God. They imagine that all their religious knowledge makes them shoe-ins to the kingdom of God. They've missed the obvious, though. That sometimes religious words hide those most in need divine rescue. Sometimes knowing all the right words doesn't mean that you actually know Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the children of the serpent, will ultimately kill Jesus, but he's going to burn their kingdom up. Here at the end, I can just imagine John shouting to the crowds. He's like, leave the doomed kingdom. A fire is coming to light up the darkness. Get out before it's too late. The new kingdom is here. The old wretched kingdom is burning up. Repent. Switch allegiances while you can. And John uses the image of a winnowing fork here. Does anybody know what a winnowing fork is? It's just like a pitchfork, which I happen to have here. Um, anybody ever use a pitchfork? Oh, yeah, we used it here at the art center when we put down balls. But a winnowing fork would often be made out of wood. The spokes would be made out of uh, wood or bone to keep them nice and light. And what they would do is they would take a huge pile of grain and they would get a scoop of it and they would toss it up in the air like this. And when they did that, it would separate the grain from the husk. And so the lighter husk would break away through the agitation of being tossed up and down over and over again. And the heavier grain would fall to the ground. And in the windy, dusty climate of Israel, as they tossed the husk up in the air, the wind would blow the husk off the grain. And so the husk is getting blown away and, you know, hitting people down the street and they're like, what's in my eye? But the grain is falling down in the top. 
And as he did this over and over and over again, all day long, eventually, at the end of the day, you would have a pile of grain, and all the husk would be blown away. And that's the example that John is using here. And he says, Jesus, the king, is coming, and the winnowing fork is in his hands, and he's going to keep picking up the pile of people and tossing it up in the air, tossing it up in the air, tossing it up in the air, until all the husk blow away and all the grain remains. The farmer didn't pick apart the grain and the husk, a little agitation revealed what they truly were. The old kingdom is blowing away, a new kingdom is rushing in to replace us, and in this new kingdom, acting religious, knowing the right religious words won't be enough. In verse 8, John tells the Pharisees and Sadducees, you need to produce fruit keeping with repentance keeping with a change in allegiance. He says you need to produce fruit that acts like you're a kingdom person. Knowing about love doesn't mean you're loving. Being able to define love doesn't mean you're loving. Saying you love doesn't mean you show people love. I was reading um, someone from a, he was a secular social justice warrior, and uh, he was talking about one of the biggest problems with the social justice mo movement that he sees right now is People say the right thing on social media or on billboards or on their shop windows, but they actually don't treat the people who live on their street the right way. And he says, people won't believe our message if we don't actually live it out to the people who know us best. He says, it's easy to post something on social media. It's hard to actually treat the people on your street that way. And I thought, he's talking about something completely different than I am. But at the same time, how true is that of Christianity? Where we say things on our billboards, or we say things on our social media pages, but we don't actually love the people who know us best. This new kingdom won't celebrate people who know the right answers, but treat people the wrong way. People who know the right things to do, but don't do them. Words aren't enough. We need to act. We can say all the right things, to the culture and the world that we live in today, and they won't care until our actions line up with what we say. Most of the things we say will be forgotten without making, ever making a dent in the direction of the world. Don't let that discourage you, though, because the way we live and love changes people around us all the time. It's how the new kingdom dismantles the old one. We spend way too much time talking about our positions. That's old kingdom thinking. It's a new year. It's time to start living out of love. It's time to stop just talking about living and loving like Jesus and start living. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. And not just coming and giving a sermon and then disappearing, but you came and you lived among us. You didn't just talk about living in community. You live in community. You lived with 12 of your best friends and went on a road trip throughout Israel. You showed people what it looked like to care for the hurt and the needy, what it looked like to care about the forgotten and the outcast, what it looked like to touch the leper and to spend time with children. Lord, you showed us what matters most. Forgive me for so often having the right words, but totally the wrong words. God, if I don't treat the people who know me best well, then I can't say that I know your love. I might know about it, but until I practice it, it's just an idea or a theory. God, I pray in 2022 that we're people who don't just talk about living and loving like you, but we're people who live like you in our everyday, ordinary life. That we recognize what's going to change this world is not us getting a huge platform to shout a message because most people hear it or remember it or be changed by it. But every day people are changed by the way we listen, the way we live, and the way we love. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ.
Thank you. 